All right, welcome back. This is chapter five in the Essential Cosmic Perspective, Light, the Cosmic Messenger, chapter five. So we're gonna go through this. It's gonna be a little bit longer than chapter four. Our goals for learning is what is light, and what is matter, and how do light and matter interact? This is the electromagnetic spectrum, and you can see from the left, you have gamma rays, which are very short waves, uh, but are very high energy. And you go down the list to x-rays, ultraviolet light, very thin strip called the visible light, and then heat energy, infrared, and radio, which has long wavelengths, long waves, and have less, less energy. So light is an electromagnetic wave. And so the wavelength is defined as from one peak to another peak is the wavelength. Frequency is how many waves go through a certain period in one second. Particles of light are called photons. Each photon has a wavelength and a frequency. And the energy of a photon depends on its frequency. So light and matter can interact with an emission, an absorption, a transmission, either through transparent objects emitting light, or opaque objects block or absorb the light and reflecting or scattering. Reflecting and scattering. Movie screens scatter light in all directions. A mirror reflects light in a particular direction. Learning from light. What are the three basic types of spectra? How does light tell us what things are made of? How do stars tell us the temperatures of the planets and stars? And how does light tell us the speed of a distant object? So there are three types of spectra. What is a spectrum? A spectrum is when you take white light and you break it up into its component colors. Uh, you know, the Roy G. Biv, red, orange, green, yellow, and, and so on and the line. So this line you see on the screen is a spectrum. And if we have some bright peaks in it, these are called emission lines. And we'll discuss how that forms in a minute. A continuous spectrum looks like this. You see all the colors, no lines. You might have something absorbing something else, and then you see these dark lines and dips. These are called absorption line spectrum, and you see the same thing over here. So in a continuous spectrum, the spectrum of a common incandescent light bulb spans all visible wavelengths without interruption. And so you take that light, you take it to the prism, you split it up, and you see a rainbow. That's a continuous spectrum. In an emission line, a thin or low density cloud of gas emits light only at specific wavelengths that depend on its composition and temperature, producing a spectrum with bright emission lines. You have a cloud of gas going through a prism, and you see bright lines. In the absorption spectrum, you have a hot source going through a cloud of gas, then through a prism. The cloud of gas absorbs certain specific wavelengths of light, leaving the rest behind, and you see that in dark lines. So most stars absor have absorption lines in them. So this, this is really what 80% of all, all astronomy really is, is studying these absorption lines in stars. And the lines and where they are tell us what materials made up that star, like hydrogen, helium, oxygen, neon, different elements. This is a spectrum of, the, of, the, of our sun. <clears throat> you can see there's all kinds of, of uh, absorption lines all throughout it. So like I said, each, each line is a chemical fingerprint of what is in it. So the top line is helium, the middle line is sodium, and these are called H and K sodium lines. And then the neon is really cool to see a neon spectrum. A lot of reds and oranges, that's why a lot of neon lights look, look red. So how does light tell us about the temperature of planets and stars? Well, nearly all large or dense objects emit thermal radiation, including stars, planets, and yourself. 
an object's thermal radiation spectrum depends on only one property, and that is temperature. So we're going to analyze a real spectrum here. We've seen this before. By carefully studying the features of a spectrum, we can learn a great deal about the object that created it. Okay. So in this part, we see reflected sunlight. Continuous spectrum of visible light is like the sun, except that some of the blue light has been absorbed. There's less blue light over here. The object must look red because there's a lot of red light up here. This is intensity. Over here, we have thermal radiation. The infrared, infrared spectrum peaks at a wavelength corresponding to a temperature of 225 Kelvin. Carbon dioxide absorption lines are in a fingerprint for CO2. What this object is, do you think? Another ultraviolet emission lines indicating a hot upper atmosphere. What could this object be? It's Mars. Yes, Mars. The Doppler effect. This is where you see objects moving forward towards you or away from you. If an object is moving away from us, we're going to see what's called a red shift. And that's where the, all the lines shift towards the red end on the right side. The faster it's moving away from us, the further away from the normal in the top spectrum you see those lines go. If the object is moving towards you, that's called a blue shift. And you can see that the lines are shifting towards the left, which is the blue and violet. Okay, telescopes. Why do we put telescopes in space and what can we learn from them? So the two big things about telescopes is telescopes collect more light than our eyes. This is the light collecting area. And telescopes can see more detail than our eyes, and this is called angular resolution. Telescopes and instruments can detect light that is invisible to our eyes, such as infrared and ultraviolet. This is a picture of the twin Keck telescopes. They're in Hawaii, and these are both 10 meters across. 10 meters. You see the guy in the well there to show you how big it is. Let's start with a basic telescope design. This is the one meter refractor uh, in Chicago. And uh, 40 inches is really all you can see with this uh, telescope, how big the lens is. And you can see really the scope of the size of the telescope. You see the operator here and another one up here. And you can really see just how long this telescope had to be for that 40 inch lens. And this is brought up in the quiz and exams about a discussion question about why 40 inches is as big as you can get. Well, if you think of, think of a lens, it's made out of glass and it's going to bend as it gets heavier and heavier. That 40 inch lens is so heavy that it starts to bow and bend and distort the light as we, that, that size. So we really can't make a bigger refracting telescope bigger than that. However, with reflecting telescopes, we use mirrors. And most telescopes today are used with mirror segments. And so we can build small 40-inch mirrors and build a bunch of them and hook them all together to get a big 10-meter telescope. Here's Mauna Kea in Hawaii, all the telescopes. And this is a radio telescope built into a valley in Puerto Rico. It does radio signals. Now you see the radio signals are longer, and so this is why the uh, dishes are so big. Radio waves can be so long, though, that we need to build an array of satellite dishes to detect them. And this is called interferometry, where you link up multiple radio dishes uh, in a line to make a, a big, actually a big telescope. So here is the one in Chile, Atacama. And uh, you can see these are all lined up to give us a bigger field of view. So if you want to own your own telescope, we recommend you first buy some binoculars. Usually they're about 7 by 35. You get much more for the same amount of money. Ignore the magnification. That's a sales pitch. Same with buying a telescope. They'll say, 
this telescope can magnify 700 times. Well, not really. It doesn't work that way. What you want to look at is the aperture size. This is an 8 inch telescope, a 4 inch telescope, the optical quality, and the portability of it. How easily is it? can you take it outside? And there are various magazines like Astronomy, Sky and Telescope, Mercury Magazines, and Astronomy Clubs. And there is a, a two astronomy clubs in Springfield. Why do we put telescopes in space? Because uh, to get away from the blur of the atmosphere. Problems due to Earth's atmosphere include light pollution, street lights. Turbulence causes twinkling in the blurry images. We take that out when we go into space. And the atmosphere absorbs most of the electromagnetic spectrum, including all ultraviolet and x-ray and most infrared. So we can overcome this by putting telescopes in space. And we have uh, the x-ray observatory, Chandra. A friend of mine used to help run that. Or on the Earth, we can put in what's called adaptive optics. This is where you put pistons, like you'd see in a car, uh, underneath each mirror of the telescope, like we saw in the Keck. And they adjust the mirrors individually 30 times every second to form a more sharpened image, higher resolution image. And so you can see here Neptune without the adaptive optics on the left and with on the right for a sharper view. This is Jupiter's moon Io doing the same thing. So we know that telescopes help us learn about the universe. We can see fainter objects and more detail than we can see by the eye. And specialized telescopes allow us to learn more than we could from visible light alone. So why do we put telescopes in space? They are above the Earth's atmosphere and therefore not subject to light pollution, atmospheric distortion, or atmospheric absorption of light. 